welcome, or to put it more Scottishly, hello, Valcha. Welcome to City Breaks Edinburgh, episode 14, Art. I'm Marion Jones. Edinburgh then, national capital, of course, of course, lots of art galleries. As ever, there could be a problem with what to include, how best to summarise, etc. And the plan I've come up with for the episode is to work through the main galleries, yes, giving a highlight about what to expect inside them, but focusing particularly on anything very Scottish. And there are quite a few galleries to choose from. The National Gallery for Scotland, the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art, the City Art Centre, and some smaller places where you can find art too. For example, at the Botanical Gardens. And I'm going to make a little mention of some of the street statues too. And very briefly, the Queen's Gallery at Holyrood. So then, best to start with the National Gallery for Scotland, I think. A proud building, opened in Victorian times, but in neoclassical style, columns like a Roman temple. Built, in fact, quote, as a temple to the fine arts, but with the aim of making art accessible to all. In fact, when it first opened, it was known as the Royal Institution for the Encouragement of the Fine Arts in Scotland, and a point was made of opening on Saturday and Wednesday evenings so that working people too could get in and see their national art collection. So, what will you find inside? Two main categories, really. One, European art from the Renaissance to the Impressionists, and the Scottish collection. And the European collection, which starts on the top floor and works its way downwards, is chronological, which I have to admit, I really like. I always find that nice and explanatory. I know where I am. I can see how things developed. And taking then just a few treasures from that collection, yes, in chronological order, Perhaps best known amongst the early pieces are the Trinity panels, painted in the mid-15th century by Hugo van der Goes, and striking a chord particularly because on the reverse are portraits of three of Scotland's monarchs, James III, James IV, painted in fact before he became king, I think, and Queen Margaret of Denmark. Also Queen of Scotland because she was married to James III. There is a Cassoni from medieval Italy, so a marriage chest with painted scenes on it, in this case, rather gruesomely, of the Black Death. There's a Botticelli, the Virgin adoring the sleeping Christ child, a Titian, the Three Ages of Man, one of Rembrandt's many, many, many self-portraits, this one done when he was 51, a Velasquez painting called An Old Woman Cooking Eggs, a Monet, Haystacks, and also works by Gauguin and Bert Morisot, the best-known female French Impressionist. But let's get on to the Scottish art collection, and here particularly works by four artists who were at the heart of the Scottish Enlightenment in Edinburgh, who between us give, as one of the guidebooks said, an authentic picture of pre-industrial Scotland without distortion or sentimentality. The earliest of the four is one Alan Ramsay, born in 1713, and the other three are pretty much contemporaries and each known for their own particular specialism. So that would be Alexander Naismith and his landscapes, Henry Rayburn, known particularly for his portraits of people, and David Wilkie, who did domestic scenes, village scenes, little snapshots of country life. So to start with Alan Ramsay then, Edinburgh born and educated, but someone who learned his trade in London and in Italy, then returned to Scotland and made his name particularly in the field of portrait painting becoming, in fact, the artist of choice for wealthy patrons and making lots of money while he was about it. So he painted in 1757 the Prince of Wales, no less, so the future George III, just three years before he came to the throne. And in 1763, he painted George's wife, Queen Charlotte. And here, too, you can see pictures of philosophers of the day, David Hume, for example, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It might explain his popularity to say that he was known as somebody who'd moved on, really, from the formality of portraits, as had been in the past, and was able to depict the sitter's individuality as well. It probably helped that he moved very much in establishment circles. He was friends with Voltaire and Rousseau and David Hume and Adam Smith, a celebrated cultural figure of the period, as I saw it described. Moving on to Alexander Naismith, then, born in 1758, the father of Scottish landscape painting, as he became known. Also an Edinburgh man, also someone who'd studied art in London before returning to his native city to set up as a portrait painter. A 
At least that's what he tried first, although he wasn't quite so successful at that. It's said firstly because Alan Ramsey was already established in the field, and also Naismith is said to have had rather liberal views, which meant that if he worked for wealthy clients, they didn't always get on too well. So gradually, gradually, he turned to landscapes, for which he did get much recognition. Christopher McNabb, for example, author of A History of Edinburgh, described how he, quote, painted with boldness and scale and invested images with faithfulness to nature. He painted large-scale panoramic views of Scottish country houses and castles. For example, one called A View of Tantallon Castle, very dramatic, castle on a rock, crashing waves. I think nature painting was his first love. The nearer you can get to it, the better, he once said. But he painted pictures of Edinburgh too. For example, one called Edinburgh Castle and the Norloch, painted in 1824. But looking back to the time in the 18th century, before the loch had been drained. A picture from the era when the new town was being built, which shows men dumping rubble from its construction into the loch. When he died, his friend David Wilkie wrote, He was the founder of the Landscape Painting School in Scotland and by his taste and talent has for many years taken the lead in the patriotic aim of enriching his native land with the representations of her romantic scenery. Then there's Sir Henry Rayburn, another well-known Enlightenment figure, also someone who was Edinburgh-born and then went abroad, to Italy in this case, as part of his education, but who then returned to his native Edinburgh to set up a portrait business. He too painted many famous people, Sir Walter Scott, for example, Adam Smith, David Hume. He was elected to the Royal Academy and became such an establishment figure that when George IV visited in 1822, he united Mr. Rayburn, who then became Sir Henry Rayburn. Another of his subjects was the well-known, at the time at least, violinist and composer Neil Gow, billed as Scotland's most famous fiddler and a well-known composer of reels, so those Scottish dance tunes, and someone who travelled all over the country playing at balls and festivals. A painting which I saw being described as capturing, quote, an enduring icon of Scottish musicianship. Recognised today, I think, all over the world, is one of his other paintings, a portrait of the Reverend Robert Walker skating on Duddington Loch. I'm sure if you've seen that, you will remember it and it has been quite widely seen on short red tins and publicity for the National Gallery. A rather solemn-looking reverend, in his dog collar, gliding seemingly effortlessly on his skates across the loch. The Reverend Robert Walker was a real person, minister of the Canongate Kirk, in fact, at the bottom end of the Royal Mile, and a member of the Edinburgh Skating Society, a group which often met at Tuddington Loch, just outside Edinburgh. And then there's perhaps my personal favourite, an 1811 portrait of one Colonel Alistair MacDonald of Glengarry. I think it was the description I enjoyed as much as the portrait, for he was described as, quote, a chief famed for his spectacular commitment to Highland dress and for the mismanagement of his estates. There was praise for Sir Henry Rayburn from Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote that he could, quote, plunge at once through all the constraint and embarrassment of the sitter and present the face clear, open and intelligent, as at the most disengaged moments. And the writer Duncan J.D. Smith, in his book Edinburgh, A History of the City, wrote that he, quote, painted Scotland's great and good, and if today we feel we know them better than Scots of any other age, we owe that to his vivid and revealing art. And then there's Sir David Wilkie. Born in the 1780s, so slightly later than the previous two artists, and known for his paintings of life in the Scottish villages and countryside, pictures like Pitlessie Fair from 1804 and the Village Festival, 1812. Pitlessie was actually his hometown, somewhere which had an annual cow fair, and this so captured Wilkie's imagination that he used to sit during his father's sermons in church, apparently sketching ideas in his Bible for a painting of the fair. When he was 19, he did actually paint it, and when he took it to London, it met with almost immediate success and gained him several prestigious commissions, so it launched his career, really. It's one of those paintings of a large-scale scene with lots of little mini-scenes in it, lots of individuals, social groups. So you've got the well-dressed ladies of the village, you've got the farm labourers, children playing, 
There are two British Army soldiers trying to recruit a young man, a reminder that this was painted during the Napoleonic Wars, and nearby, two children fighting over a toy soldier. I think he must have had a sense of humour because he signed his name in the bottom left-hand corner of the painting on an upturned wheelbarrow and was careful to show a dog urinating on his name. He became known too for paintings which showed social and economic reality, social comment paintings. I'm not sure any of them are here, but the best-known ones are, for example, from 1806, The Blind Fiddler, which shows a fiddler who stopped to play for a family and contrasts the relative wealth that they have with his poverty. There's another one called Distraining for Rent, which shows a landlord visiting the crowded home of a poorer family, seen as a criticism of the landlord class. He also illustrated the songs and poems of Robert Burns, but his true genius was said to be for showing domestic scenes with anonymous characters, paintings that build up a history of Scotland. On the National Gallery website, I found a list of the most searched for paintings that they possess. There are five, the top one being The Old Woman Cooking Eggs by Velasquez and also including The Skating Minister and a portrait of The Honourable Mrs Graham by Thomas Gainsborough. At number two on the list is the painting which I best recognised of everything that I saw and that is Sir Edwin Landseer's painting The Monarch of the Glen. So we must give him and it a mention. Sir Edwin Landseer then was one of those precocious children by age 12, he'd had a painting displayed at the Royal Academy. I don't think he was Scottish, but he went to Scotland every year. He loved the hunting. He loved sketching what he saw. He became Queen Victoria's favourite artist, was knighted, in fact, in 1850. And the monarch of the Glen is certainly his most famous picture. So it shows a royal stag, which is, apparently, a 12-point stag, i.e. a stag with 12 points on his antlers painted in his London studio, but from sketches which he'd made in Scotland. When I saw it, I thought, firstly, yes, I recognise that, and two, yes, how Scottish. But reading about it, I discovered that it does divide opinion. Some people love it because it encapsulates the grandeur and majesty of Scotland's highlands, showing a close-up of this proud and glorious creature set against beautiful Scottish scenery, something I saw described somewhere as a single emblematic creature viewed in a moment of exhilaration. But for others, it's a problem. They thought it was a curious choice of subject. It was painted, they said, during the Highland Clearances, a period when many poor Scottish people were moved out of their homes so that others could make commercial use of them, perhaps for sheep farming or stag hunting. And yet, say the critics, the painting makes no mention of this. So then, what to think? i just leave you with two or three facts about this painting. 1. Some anonymous person wrote a poem about it, which begins like this. Up rose the monarch of the glen, majestic from its lair, surveyed the scene with piercing ken, and snuffed the fragrant air. I guess that person was in the What a Wonderful Painting category. You have to add too that it's one of the world's most instantly recognisable marketing images. It's on many a short red tin, it's referenced in other paintings. And it's important to note that it's only here in the National Gallery for Scotland because it was bought quite recently, in 2016 I think, after a hugely successful appeal for donations, which came in from around the world. It sounds then as if native Scots and lots of those people all over the other continents, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, etc., with Scottish roots, were agreed that the National Gallery for Scotland was the place to keep this majestic painting. OK, let's move on to another gallery then. This one was my favourite, in fact, the National Portrait Gallery. Before you even get inside, you have to notice that it really is quite a building. As the guidebook puts it, a distinctive landmark on Edinburgh's Queen Street, the Scottish National Portrait Gallery is a grand neo-Gothic building in red sandstone. The north and east-facing sides feature an elaborate scheme of decorative sculptures, poets, monarchs and statesmen. Watch over Queen Street and North St Andrew Street, while William Wallace and Robert the Bruce guard the entrance. And when you get inside, the entrance hall is immediately massively impressive. Here's Duncan J. Smith's description. In the main entrance hall, an elaborate arts and crafts scheme of decoration was employed. A dozen columns with gilded capitals form an arcade supporting a first-floor balcony. 
across the surface of the arcade is painted an extraordinary processional frieze of 150 notable Scots, from St Ninian to Robert Burns. A contemporary critic described the work by Englishman William Brassy Hole as one of the most notable essays in mural decoration ever accomplished in this country. And it is glorious. You can stand there for ages picking out people that you recognise, everyone from St Cuthbert and St Aidan right up to the 19th century. Little scenes like the landing of St Margaret at Queensbury are depicted. There's John Knox, there's Mary of Guise and Mary Queen of Scots, there's Lord Darnley, David Rizzio, all done like a medieval frieze with those deep jewel colours and some golden highlights. I really thought it was the most beautiful thing I saw in the whole of Edinburgh. But on to the paintings. So if you want to know something about Scottish history, this is the place, because here you will see paintings from the Renaissance to the present day. 17 galleries worth, in fact. There are famous paintings of James VI of Scotland, or James I of England, of Mary Queen of Scots, and of Bonnie Prince Charlie, or Prince Charles Edward Stuart, as we should probably call him, painted at a key moment in Scottish history. October 1745. Bonnie Prince Charlie had just defeated the armies of George II, he'd succeeded in capturing the city of Edinburgh, and installed himself in the palace of Holyrood House taking a breather before the planned march to London in the hope of regaining the whole of the British throne. So he chose this moment to summon the painter, Alan Ramsay, to, quote, come to the palace of Holyrood House as soon as possible in order to take His Royal Highness's picture. And yes, there he is, looking assured, fresh from his recent successes, and dressed in a princely fashion. A painting completed then, just before all of this came crashing down and Stuart hopes were dashed by the English. Here too you'll find two portraits of Robert Burns by Alexander Naismith, painted several decades apart, the first one in 1787, an engraving for a new edition of Burns's poems, showing him fashionably dressed, but set against a rural background, showing the importance of Burns's roots. The second portrait was painted after Burns's death, another country scene, showing Burns in front of the old Brig of Doon in Ayrshire, which is of course where Burns was born. Burns and Naismith were friends, and the painting is said to have originated on the country walk that they took together when Naismith took the opportunity to do some sketching. And this painting is said to be the inspiration for many of the statues of Burns that you will find all over the world. To wander around the gallery is to feel that you are seeing paintings of all the Scots who've ever found fame including in recent times. There are politicians, Sir Alec Douglas Home, for example, the Labour leader, John Smith. There are musicians, Evelyn Glennie, Emily Sande, Nicola Benedetti, the actress Tilda Swinton, sportsmen such as Sir Chris Hoy, and lots of writers, some painted individually, Dame Muriel Spark, Ian Rankin, and also some group paintings, for example, The Poet's Pub by Alexander Moffat. I think it's an imagined picture, in which he shows all the major Scottish poets and writers from the later 20th century, ten of them in total, including Norman McCaig and Hugh McDermott, all gathered in a pub, which in fact many of them did often frequent. I'll let the painter himself explain. As a student, I shared a studio in Rose Street with John Bellamy, and we haunted the bars where a thriving bohemian atmosphere was everywhere in evidence, keeping company with fellow artists, musicians, actors, publishers, lawyers, all sorts of outlaws, and the poets themselves, who form the main subject of the Poets' Pub. And there's another group painting called the Crime Writers' Club, showing nine of Scotland's most successful crime writers, and made at the Bloody Scotland International Crime Writing Festival, an annual event which takes place in Stirling, and makes reference to the fact that Scotland has an international reputation for crime fiction, or tartan noir as it's called. So those, I would say, are the two main unmissable galleries. Let's have a quick run through the others. The Museum of Modern Art, for example, not in the city centre, but out at West End. In fact, there are steps from the back leading down to the Waters of Leith. In the main building, known as Modern Art One, lots of 20th century works. Some European, think Matisse, Picasso, and some Scottish. By, for example, a group of artists known as the Scottish Colourists, who were 1920s, 1930s sort of era, based on Impressionism, 
but mingled in with the traditions of Scottish painting. Think bright colours, vivid brushstrokes, think to island landscapes and scenes from Edinburgh. There are later 20th century works too, by David Hockney and Tracy Emin, for example, and Scottish in flavour, things like a collection of Joan Eardley's portraits of Glasgow street children. Of course, if there's a modern art one, there has to be a modern art too. And here is Duncan J.D. Smith in his book Only in Edinburgh, describing what you'll find in there. Quote, On permanent display is a collection of works gifted by Leithbourne sculptor Sir Edward Palozzi, including his towering robot-like sculpture Vulcan and a reconstruction of his studio. It also contains a world-class collection of Dada and Surrealist material, including works by Dali, Magritte and Alberto Giacometti. And then back in the city centre, there is the very happening City Art Centre, a former warehouse which houses 4,500 works of art, all kinds of things, oil, watercolour, drawings, prints, sculptures, installations, photographs. Works I've read by all Scotland's leading artists from the 17th century onwards, and covering all of Scotland's major art movements. So you'll find artists from the Edinburgh School from the middle of the 20th century, from a group known as the Glasgow Boys. Also here you'll find the Scottish colourists. There are often temporary exhibitions too, and there's even an art space where you can go and create your own artwork. So that covers, I think, all the major art venues, but there are a couple of other places to mention. The Botanical Gardens, for example, which also has a gallery, stages exhibitions and has some outdoor sculptures. The place where you can see, for example, a giant pine cone. And the East Gate, a large stainless steel sculpture in the shape of what I saw described as stylized rhododendrons. So the general theme, I think, is botany meets art. Then there's the Queen's Gallery next to the Palace of Holyrood, which stages changing exhibitions, taking items from the Royal Collection, which would otherwise not be seen very often. So there you may happen across old master paintings or rare furniture. Sometimes there are decorative arts, sometimes images from their vast photograph collection. There's quite a lot of art on display at the Georgian House Museum, some of which I talked about in the episode on that, but I just wanted to mention their collection of James Tassy works because they are a little unusual. So James Tassy's dates were 1735 to 99. He was a Glasgow trained stonemason, but today it is really for his little portrait medallions that he's particularly well known. He made them using glass paste. He made over 500 of them, many of them of Edinburgh's Enlightenment figures who would come along for a sitting of two and a half hours, get a medallion of themselves, and pay much less than a portrait would have cost. So if you go to the Georgian Museum, do look out for those, because they're an important record of the fashions of the Georgian era. And really, last of all, but certainly not least, we must mention Sir John Steele, dates 1804-91, to who, after his Edinburgh education and his travels in Rome, became a sculptor. Became, in fact, in 1838, Queen Victoria's sculptor in Scotland, no less, and there are a number of his works dotted about the city. There's the Duke of Wellington outside Register House, there's Sir Walter Scott in the Princess Street Gardens, there's one of Queen Victoria on the roof of the RSA building, and in Charlotte Square, Prince Albert, at the unveiling of which you may remember from an earlier episode, Queen Victoria herself, who had visited the city especially to see it, knighted him. So, all in all, we can conclude, I think, fairly, that Edinburgh is a city which takes its art very seriously indeed. It's certainly a centre where you can see lots of important European art. It's particularly, though, perhaps the place to see Scottish art. And I hope I've managed to give a flavour of that in the episode. And talking of flavours, that's a nice segue into mentioning the next episode in line episode 15, which in fact is going to be the penultimate in the Edinburgh series, in which I'm going to concentrate on food, the flavours and delights and specialities of Scottish cuisine. Everything from delicious seafood and venison to the other end of the spectrum, the porridge and the now infamous deep fried Mars bar. So I hope you'll be able to join me for that. Meanwhile, let me just finish off by thanking you very much for listening and saying goodbye. In Gaelic, of course. Here goes. Tarpa leave. <laughs>
Agus Marshin Leave. <laughs>